Welcome to Positive Productivity, episode 168. The Positive Productivity podcast was created to empower entrepreneurs to achieve and appreciate personal and professional success. I'm your host, Kim Sutton, and if you're ready, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of Positive Productivity. I'm so happy to have you here. And today I am thrilled to introduce our guest, Brian Felchuk. Brian is the best-selling author of the book, Do a Day, How to Live a Better Life Every Day. He's also a regular contributor for Inc. Magazine. And there's so much more, but I'm going to let Brian tell you all about it. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Would you please share more about your amazing story with the audience? Yeah. So I feel like I always go down this long rabbit hole when I give the backstory. So if I'm going too long, please just jump in and be like, that's great, but you're you're boring everyone. So I am, I'll get this out of the way. I'm an insurance executive by day. So that's like the least exciting part of my life. So we'll set that aside. But there's two really big components of my backstory that define a lot of who I am as a person. And I'm a father and husband and a lot of it ties to that. But I grew up uh, the youngest of four kids in a family that was coming apart. So, you know, divorce, I was like five or six years old. Look, it's like half the country deals with this. And as that young of a kid, you don't really know how to process those feelings. And kids really just need to feel safe and secure. That's like this innate basic need that they have. And I didn't. And um, I couldn't turn to my parents for that because they were embroiled in their stuff. So I turned to food. You know, it wasn't yelling. It wasn't moving out. It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't calling me names. Uh, It was just there and comforting. And I would say slowly but surely, but it was actually pretty rapid. I went from being a skinny little active kid to actually morbidly obese. Uh, And I spent my childhood right through most of high school really overweight. And the last weight that I got to was 248 that I know of. Like that's the last weight I saw on a scale. And then I just stopped weighing myself because I couldn't deal with it. So I probably got up into the 260s, maybe 270, something like that. I was really lucky to have a very dedicated, caring person at my high school who ran the PE program who helped me just change my relationship with my body and wellness. And it was the first time going into like a physically active situation, I wasn't being judged as like, you're fat and you're lazy and you can't. It was like, oh, have you tried this? Let me show you how to do this thing. Do you enjoy that? It was much more like exploration and figure out for yourself what you like. So I was able to lose weight in high school, which is great, but I did it for like kind of surface level reasons. And I did it about reasons like, you know, people thinking I was the fat kid and not wanting to be seen that way anymore or um, not wanting to be judged as lazy or not good enough or, you know, getting into your teenage years, into your 20s, like you want to start dating. And I was like, well, no girl's going to like me. So, you know, it was all about this outward appearance and judgment, whether it's real or whether it was in my head. But it wasn't about things deep within me. And to be fair, as a teenager, I probably wasn't ready for that. But because of that, through my 20s into my 30s, I put back on about half the weight. And that was slow and steady. And I never really looked fat again. I just looked, I would say, like, I looked American. You know, like, I didn't really look different from anybody else. But I was, like, in the mid-220s by the time I was 32. And that's the second pivotal, like, definitional moment in my life. And um, I was 32 years old. My son was about two and a half. And my wife, um, this is the summer of 2011, she was bedridden with a chronic illness that had been flaring up throughout her life and never really got diagnosed. And she had one of these flare ups and it didn't stop and it just kept getting worse. And so her doctors had basically given up on her. They had given up on her. Um, She was losing two pounds a day and they couldn't stop it and they didn't know why. And her doctor was going on vacation. He's like, well, let's check in in six weeks when I'm back. And I was Wait, like, she was losing two pounds a day and your two pounds doctor a day is going on vacation and says check in in six weeks. That's what I said. I was like, do the math. She literally doesn't have the strength to stay out of bed for more than, you know, a few seconds to go to the bathroom. Um, that's about it. 
and she's not going to be here in six weeks. And all he had to say was, oh, well, then take her to the ER if there's a problem. And I was just like, this is madness. So that was June 30th, 2011, that I had that conversation with him. And I went into our bedroom, and my son was standing at the foot of the bed looking at his mom, who was a stay-at-home mom and had been there with him every day. And, you know, this is not what this little boy needs. And meanwhile, I looked at myself and said, you know, what, what the heck is going on here? And what am I doing? I was overweight again. I was depressed. Obviously, I was very unhappy with the situation. Like, you know, as a spouse, most spouses will face the idea of losing their spouse at some point in their marriage. But that typically comes when you're in your 70s, your 80s, your 90s, not when you're in your early 30s, just having your first kid. Uh, So that was a really just shocking kind of, of thing to experience. And I felt like I was letting my son down so tremendously because he's losing his mother and he's losing his father just at a slower rate. And I wasn't the father he needed me to be. You know, I was unhappy. I didn't have energy. I didn't have patience, most importantly. So I wouldn't play with him. I, I really wouldn't do anything because it's like, I have to go do this. You know, I have to go get food. I have to go do the laundry. I have to go to work. I have to this. I, have to that. I was miserable and I was miserable to be around. And this poor little kid didn't deserve that on both sides of the coin. And that was such a wake up moment for me. You know, the first time when I lost weight, I didn't have that real reason. The second time I had a very clear reason and my responsibility to my son, my love for him, the pride I feel in being his dad and what it means to be there for him, because it may just be me. Not to ruin the story, but I think it's worth saying my wife is still alive. And that's obviously an amazing thing. And there's a number of things that happened coming out of that summer that turned her story around and mine. She is still sick, but it's something we deal with every day and it's not threatening her life anymore. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. That's important to, you know, it's like spoiler alert, but that's kind of an important thing to share that um, she is still here. Um, It sounds, I mean, you've said so many things that have resonated with me already. I mean, right away when you said at 220, you just fit in with so many Americans and that's so true right now. I mean, yeah look around. I mean, you put you in an audience and you probably wouldn't be any different from anybody else. No. But then you throw in the the living the life of the have tos and not yeah. the get tos. Yeah. I've been there. I have so been there. And it was actually not that much different of a time from you. It was 2008, 2009, 2010 yeah. in that period. And the have tos had led to me actually eating and putting on a lot of weight and being depressed and but there was I didn't have the serious health issue with a spouse but but that's American too the have to's and the and I think actually the most American thing of all and this is what I work with people a lot when I coach them it's this mindlessness you know we're just sort of we're going through life we're not living it's all the stuff you have to do it's not there's no reason for it there's no you know other than like responsibility or obligation There's no desire, there's no purpose, there's no passion. And very quickly you become an automaton and you become really unhappy. And so it's no surprise so many people are overweight. I mean, aside from our our food system and, and advertising and all that, like there's definitely things stacked against us, but we don't do things with purpose or reason. And that's that's what became clear for me. And in a sense, I'm lucky that I had it shoved in front of me because I'm not sure that I would have woken up otherwise. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you don't have to have a gun in your face to wake up and say, hang on, I want to do better. Somebody help me. Brian, if you had been asked back then, what was your why? What do you think you would have said? It would have been much more tied to tactical things that need doing, like paying the bills and cooking the food and doing the laundry. And that's a heck of a purpose. That's an employee. You know, that's not a. uh, So you were an employee to your life. I was an employee of of my situation or of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the guy who did the stuff. I wasn't an act like my wife and son were the family and I worked there. That's not on them. That's on me. Right. And that, that was the big difference. And part of that is how I'm wired. And there's a whole other side of my backstory from how I grew up around the divorce situation that led me to be a, a doer. Like I'm a doer and a fixer. It's it's how I'm wired. So part of that's that's my natural inclination. 
But if you let that go too far and if you let that happen without any purpose or mindfulness, then you just end up being an employee of your life. And that's uh, I mean, if that doesn't sound attractive to people like that's that's just not the way to live. Oh, I'm sure that it's resonating with so many listeners. I know it's resonating with me because, yeah, I, too, was an employee of my life, a slave to my life to be. Let's just be totally honest. I was a slave to my life. I was living to work, to pay the bills, to buy stuff that I didn't need to make myself feel better, for which I had to go back to work to pay the bills for the stuff yeah. that I didn't need. Vicious cycle. Yep. And then there was not time to spend with my kids or my family because I was, I mean, at that point, the, the time of that specifically sticks out in my head that resonates the most with that. Wow. Resonate seems to be my word of this episode was I was working. I was having to leave my house and I was living here in Ohio, but I was driving an hour to and from work. So both ways. And then I was trying to build a business on the side and I honestly had no passion for that business either. I was doing it all for the money. Uh, Yeah. Your side business. My side business had no, was only attached to income. It didn't have anything to do with impact. So Brian, at the end of that, actually, maybe there is a health issue to bring up here. At the end of that, I was sleeping two to three nights or two to three hours a night tops and ended up going, I don't think I've even ever disclosed just how far down the rabbit hole that went for me. I ended up starting to hallucinate and I'm sure. so depressed. And I, the final straw was I felt like driving off a road and was committed. And that, that was the big eye opener for me. The first, because that actually that was the first of two times. But yeah, it was listeners. I was only committed once. You only ever need to be committed once and you get the realization that, okay, something's got to change. Take my word on that, but don't let it get there. There's more to life than working for money and being a slave to your life. So Brian, I know I'm interested and I know listeners are interested. What did the journey look like after that point? It was a, a really stark change and I just not to, to dwell on it, but thank you because that was a lot of, of deep and powerful stuff that you just revealed about yourself that, I mean, you, you clearly get it and you see just how big the cost is of living your life in, in this way. And that's, you know, I, I didn't get quite that far, but um, I was I was dying. You know, as I say, like my wife was dying more immediately. I was dying just at a much slower rate, but still not acceptable. And that kicked me hard enough. I woke up the next morning, literally, I could feel the difference as soon as I woke up. And I was like, look, I have this purpose and this clarity, I best not waste it. And I had been working out, but it was like, get on the elliptical and cover the screen with a magazine or it was before iPads. It's not like I could have a show on it, but like basically tune out for 30 minutes and then things beeping because it's finished. And, you know, maybe I'm a little sweaty. So no more of that. I got on the thing, I put in an interval program and I pushed myself hard and I was drenched at the end and exhausted, but I was, I had this huge smile on my face. I was like, that was awesome. Like it brought me back to those high school days where I was like, you know, getting into the fitness thing and and feeling really empowered. And I was like, this is great. And, you know, then I, I went to work and I was not in a happy situation at work. And I started, that was a much longer process, but I started to put some pieces in place to change that situation. And I tried very actively to be different in my family situation, which was beyond me um, and my tools at the time. So I sought help. I started talking to someone. You know, that was an active step that I would not have taken before because it would have been like, well, I don't have time for that. And that costs money. And, you know, all of the the reasons why self-care for me had to take a back seat because uh, everyone else needs to be cared for. And there's all these corny sayings, but they're just true. You can't care for anyone else if you don't care for yourself. If you've fallen apart, what are you supposed to do for others? And if people are depending on you, you absolutely have to take a moment to make sure you're in a good place. And you know what? We figured it out. We worked out the timing. We worked out like the money, you know, insurance covered it. Like it was actually completely doable. And I was catastrophizing how much of an impact all those things would have before. But now I had this clarity and I saw the reason why it was so crucial. And I went at it with a different attitude. So that really was like every everything that I started to do, I went out with a very different feeling. And the first piece was self-love, self-compassion. So no more judgment. I had spent my entire life judging myself because I was judged from such an early age. 
around my weight that, you know, that's the soundtrack that plays in my head. And I then internalize that. And so it's just enough with the negativity, enough with feeling like a failure or why is this happening to me or any of that. I need to just allow for the possibility that I'm okay and I can have an okay situation, you know, because somehow, despite all the terrible things that I thought were happening, I'm still alive and I'm doing okay. So, you know, at what point do I pause and say, wait a second, like, you know, my wife's still alive. I have an amazing son. We have a, we have a home. Um, we live in a good area. Like, we, we, you know, we're safe. I have a job, whether I like it or not, it's still a good job and it pays all the bills. And like, is it really, is it really the end of the world? No. So that, that was the foundation. And then I had this purpose all of a sudden. And then what I started to do was point those two things at really specific goals to better my life. And the first was around my weight. So I was 222 pounds and 19.5% body weight on July 1st, 2011. And I won't forget any of those numbers. I hope we'll see how when I get older, but for now, I still remember them. And I said, you know, it's, it's July, by the end of the year, I want to get down to 185. 180 was what I'd always been told was probably the right weight for my, my body. Um, but I was like, you know, 185, that, that's, that's a good place to be. And that's a pretty meaningful goal. You know, it's almost 40 pounds. That's pretty serious. It's not like I'll lose three pounds. Like, I don't know how you lose three pounds. Like, how do you purposely do that? So it was something I had to take some specific actions to get to. I set out a spreadsheet in Excel so I could track my progress. I was going to weigh myself every day and I didn't get there. So I didn't get to 185 by the end of the year. I got to 180 by October, by my birthday, actually, my 33rd birthday. Wait, so, so in half the time? Half the time. And it's because, and it, it blew my mind. Like I had lost 100 pounds before. So you think losing 40 wouldn't have scared me as much. But I think because I recognized it's not I wasn't overweight because I was eating too much or exercising too little. I was overweight because my life was not being lived the way I needed to live it. So the weight was a symptom. And it's the same thing as a little kid. I just didn't get that. So now I understood. And I was like, all right, it's not as simple as like, OK, I'm just going to diet and exercise. No, it's like I need to also work on my mind. I need to work on my relationship. I need to work on being a dad. I need to work on my like losing weight takes actually changing your life. And, and I firmly believe that you don't just change one aspect of your life in a vacuum. You, you have to reevaluate and move the whole thing in the right direction. So because of that, that pushed me to do even better than I even imagined I could. And once you have that kind of success, like you just keep going. Right. Absolutely. You brought up a incredible point about how we can often get concerned about how much is it going to cost? And we don't look at things. We don't look at situations with the right set of priorities sometimes. And we don't also consider the circumstances of if we don't do this, what is it actually going to cost us? Yeah. When it was your wife, I know you would have put whatever money you needed to to take care of her. And if it had been your son, the same thing. For sure. But let's let's get real for a second. When it comes to us, we don't do that. Yeah. How much would you say that this investment in yourself actually cost? And how much do you think it would have cost? This, I mean, take your I mean, your life would have been the biggest cost if you hadn't. So the reality is setting aside a bunch of workout clothes that I probably didn't need to buy, but I did. It really didn't cost very much at all. Uh, true out of pocket. You know, I look at like, so look, I'm, I'm a vegan and uh, that's one of the things that I, I changed along the way and I happen to eat organic as much as I can. So that costs more money, but I'm not buying meat. So the trade off is people are always like, oh, that's so expensive. I'm like, how much do you think steak costs? Like it's not, and then it's like, oh, it takes so much time. It's like, do you think like, you know, meatballs and spaghetti with cheese on it, like just appears fully cooked in front of you? No. Okay. So I haven't, I think on balance, I'm actually net zero on the food side. On the health side, I'm not spending a ton on prescription drugs and constant doctor visits and whatever. So, you know, I'm, I think I'm, I'm doing fine there too. And I have a job and I have health insurance. And so like I have coverage for a lot of the stuff, but there's a lot of things that we do outside of the covered insurance world for my wife and for myself. That's what saved her life. And, you know, I'm not going to not spend on those things. 
And then if I ask myself, well, what would it cost if my wife had died? You know, having to have a full time nanny or what, like I'm, I'm not doing that math. So I hope no one's looking at me as like, wow, he's really shallow. But I mean, if you really want to get down to it, it's like we make decisions about the, the right investments and you don't compare that to zero. It's not like, oh, this costs a thousand dollars and not co- not doing it is free. It's like, no, not doing it has ramifications. Like if I died or if I, you know, maybe it doesn't take me dying. Maybe we get divorced and I'm pushed out of my house. Divorce ain't free. You know, uh, it, it's super expensive. And the years of impact on my child, certainly not free financially or otherwise. So I don't look at it as, you know, we, we made this big investment and did it work out? It's pretty clear. And I, I haven't laid out the numbers, but it's pretty clear that I'm at least break even, but probably far, far ahead. Oh, I think you're far, far ahead. Yeah. yeah. And that's the only point I was trying to get to is how far ahead you are from making those not only financial investments, but you and your family yeah. investments and time investments. I don't think you can pick it apart. So someone asked me, do you regret going to this college versus that one? And I was like, well, I went to that college and then I went to this graduate school, which is where I met my wife, which she worked there. And, you know, I love my son, something crazy, and he exists. So, like, if I didn't go to that college, would I have gone to that school? Would I have met her? Would he exist? So what, what's, what's the point of the question? You know, it's like everything in my life, if you, if you change one aspect of those investments and in betterment, would I have any of what I have now? Would I have a, a book that's helping change people's lives? Would I you know, be writing for Inc. Magazine? Would I have a son who hugs me so tight because he's so happy to be around me? You know, like I have an amazing job. I have an amazing family. I, it's not all roses for sure, but I wouldn't have the vast majority of these things if I had compromised on any of those things. That is so beautiful. I feel almost bad circling it back around to me, but while I do want to teach people to take care of themselves and remember to sleep, I mean, it's so many of the points that you're bringing up too about investing in self-care and mindset yeah. and all of that. If I hadn't gone through this, then I wouldn't be able to share the stories. Right, right. Listeners, one of the reasons why you need to sleep so that you don't get (laughs) committed is your health insurance, if you have health insurance, won't necessarily cover that. And it was a multi tens of thousands of dollars, five day quote vacation. It would have been less expensive to invest in the beginning of a self-care journey and a vacation to Hawaii than go to the mental hospital. So just do yourself a favor and start taking care of yourself and your loved ones today. Wow. Let's move on to your book and how that came to be. I would love to hear, unless there's a part, like a huge part of the story in between. No, it's all it's all tied together. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all intertwined. So when I lost all the weight, posting on social media and whatnot, people, friends of mine are like, "Wow, you look great. What happened?" And they start to dig into the story and they're like, "You know, I, I saw what was going on with your wife. What's you know?" So they start to pick the whole thing apart and be like, could you help me? And so I started to just get, you know, every few days or weeks or whatever, a friend would be like, I've seen what's been going on. Could you, could we talk? So people came out of the woodwork asking for help. And so kind of, you know, without any purposefulness to it, I ended up having this coaching practice uh, and I got certified as a personal trainer, not to go and help people pump iron, but just to have some more of the tools and the understanding behind it. And it was it was really focused around fitness and wellness. And, you know, a lot of people in their 30s and 40s looking to lose weight. And that's fine. And what I found in every one of those instances was someone who it's like I said before, the, the weight gain was a symptom. It wasn't the problem. And so invariably, we'd end up talking much bigger than just about like, OK, what are you doing at the gym and what are you eating and how do you make better food choices? And you know, we talked about career and we talked about family and it's like it's this whole picture. And so in 2011, I, I put a name behind all that and I started something called New Bodies. Um, and that's that's my like fitness, wellness, life coaching business. And I love doing that. That's my side hustle. And I didn't do it for the income. I do a lot of my work pro bono because I just I've got a great job and I, I kind of like to have the um, the outlet, the creative and mental outlet for something I'm just genuinely passionate about, which I think is really important in a side hustle. I actually just wrote about this for Inc. Magazine. So if I didn't think that was important, that would be pretty disingenuous for me. 
Listeners, there will be a link to that article and everything else that we talk about, any other resources and Brian's book in the show notes, which you can find at thecamsutton.com forward slash PP168. Cool. But it just became really clear to me is like I, I get off these coaching calls and I was just so pumped up. I was so like, oh, this is awesome. And what really bothered me was even if I did this 24 seven, I couldn't help as many people as I wish I could. And talking to someone who's been a mentor and a guide to me, we talked through that and he's like, well, where do you want to take it? And we, you know, we had this ultimate vision that I painted and he's like, all right, now take the steps backwards and think through what that means. And I was in California for work at the time. I got up early before my flight the next morning and I went for a run. It was in San Francisco along the Embarcadero, which is just really cool, like piers and really beautiful area. And I just thought through his question of working it backwards and it hit me as like, I need to write a book. And I know what it is like it, it's it's do a day, which I've been using that term already. It was just so clear to me. It's like that's how I get scale in sharing this message out. So on the run, I structured the whole book. I was like so anxious. I got back to the hotel, showered, packed up, head to the airport, got to the terminal and just sat down and started mashing on my keyboard. I wrote the entire flight home. You know, except for the 30 minutes, the beginning and end where you can't have your laptop out. But the rest of the time, I was like just tapping away furiously. And I wrote for about 40 percent, 35, 40 percent of the book on in that one sitting, basically, because it's all in me. It's things I've been living. And that's where the book came to be. So the whole thing took me about three months to write and a year to edit, which is definitely like editing is, is the longer part because you really stop and you think about what you're saying. And it came out in March of 2017, and I was really blessed that it, it was a bestseller on Amazon in its launch, um, which is awesome because that to me is like, it's not about the sales. It's about the fact that that means a lot of people are getting it. And then I start to get the outreach. So pretty much every day for the first like six months, I get a message from someone, whether it was someone I knew or someone I didn't telling me about how it was impacting them either to help them and to help them make a change or to put perspective on things that they've been through that they hadn't really been able to process. And it's just like, this is why I did this. I'm just floored because that's why I'm doing what I do now. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. That's why I'm doing what I do now. I want to know that I'm helping people. And it's so huge when we can find that. I know that your wife and your son mean the world to you, but how amazing does it feel? Are there any words to express how that feels to know that you're impacting people like that? I just know the glow that I feel inside. And I don't know if that's the right word for it or not, but that's just how I feel. Like there's a light that turn, burns very bright whenever I get the, like, I'm so touched and I end up thanking people profusely. And they're like, why are you thanking me? I'm thinking, I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is why I'm doing this. I mentioned to you before we were recording, like people are like, oh, are you going to retire if your book's a bestseller? I was like, let me break down the economics of selling books to you. It ain't going to happen. That's not why I'm doing it. And I don't care. And I'm happy to give away copies and all that. Like, it's not about the sales. I'm doing it to change lives. And it's not me changing them. I'm giving people, hopefully, a piece of inspiration to go look really hard in themselves and in their situation and change their own life. I can't change a life. I, the only one I can change is my own. And the only one you can change is yours. So I share my story, my struggles, not to focus on me, but just to, it's almost like a case method. Like here's a bunch of situations where I've struggled or where I've had a goal I want to overcome. Let me share that with you so you can understand how I made it through using the do a day philosophy. And then let me give you some tools to try to build it yourself. But you have to be the one to go off and do it. The book's pretty short. It's like 135 pages. I don't want you spending hours and hours and hours with my content. I want you spending a little bit of time with me. And then you go off and spend the hours with you. Really dig in and figure out what actually drives you at the deepest level. And just when you think you figured it out, ask yourself why. Because there's probably a reason beneath that that you're not in touch with yet. Once you get that, then you start crafting some really meaningful goals and you go hit them. And where do a day comes in is how you hit them. 
So it's not enough to be like, I'm going to lose 40 pounds by this date. Because what happens when you've been doing great, you know, you're down 20 pounds and then you go out for Jimmy's birthday at work and everyone goes to a bar and you have a beer and three nachos and you start crying. You're like, I've ruined everything. And you run home and you eat a cheesecake and two pizzas and a liter of Coke. And you're like, oh, I've thrown everything out. So it's just it's it's over. It's ruined. What you've done is you've taken a judgment of yourself from a past action and you've lived your current life based on that judgment and you've thrown things away because of something that's not happening right now. So, you know, you made those choices in the bar that you're wishing now you didn't make. Maybe there's a good reason why you did it. Maybe that social interaction was actually something you really needed. And it's not just about weight loss. You have to be happy all around and it has to be sustainable. But because you're only looking at this past action as a negative thing, you then move into a, a depressive decision state. You move into making choices based on insecurity. And when we make choices from insecurity, we make bad choices. So, you know, it's when you piled on the cheesecake and the pizza and the soda, like that's when you made the bad choice. But then just because you did that, does that mean everything's over? Does that mean the diet's done and your whole chance of losing weight? No, it means you get up the next day and you, you do a day. You make a better choice today that has nothing to do with whether you did or didn't yesterday and you move ahead. And by the way, if you worked out a ton yesterday and you, you know, you did more than you expected, that doesn't mean you start cheating like crazy today because it doesn't matter because you, you built up a surplus. It means like take the fact that you did a great job yesterday and build from that. You know, so we we have this additive success without the pressure of our past mistakes or our fear of the future. You know, we were talking before about all of the, the have to's. I got to pay this bill and I got to do this and I got to do the laundry and I don't have time for this. And it's like you're living today in this like stress ball anxiety state because of all these have to's later. Well, guess what? You're going to do them later. You're not doing them right now. So why are you throwing away what you can do right now because of the pressure of things that may or may not happen later? It's just this is life. You know, there are things we have to deal with from time to time, but you can't deal with them all right here, right now, because they're not happening right here and right now. So if you free yourself from that yesterday and that tomorrow, you can actually achieve a lot right now. And what you'll find is a lot of those things you were feeling pressure about tomorrow actually don't happen because of how well you did today. And that's what do a day is all about. Listeners, I can't even remember what I called the episode, but episode 155 was something about how we need to stop trying to do everything. But I'm hoping that you're hearing in this episode with Brian that the things we have to do, we get to do, and the priority needs to be taking care of ourselves. Yeah. So that we can take care of others. But I don't mean take care of others as in turning ourselves back around to be a slave, but getting to spend our time with others. Yeah. I'm, you brought up another great point about, actually, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but I was thinking about a parallel between people who have gastric bypass or win the lottery. Earlier, you were talking about how we sometimes just need to ask for help and how you went out and got help. People who have gastric bypass sometimes slip back to where they were and then they get really depressed and they keep on going down the road. And same with lottery winners. They win millions, but they're in scarcity mindset and they keep on spending because they think the money is just going to be gone tomorrow like they're used to with their paycheck. So not only investing in ourselves, ourselves, but getting the help that we need, either a counselor or an advisor to help us on whatever journey our life is taking us on. And Brian does some of his work pro bono. There are so many awesome people out there. I do coaching pro bono, but there are so many people who are invested in seeing others succeed that just keep your eyes open listeners. There's, there are definitely people out there who aren't all about the money and who do want to help even if you don't have it. So just, yeah, keep your eyes open. Yeah. Brian, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation and I do hope to have many more with you, even if it's offline. Where can listeners get in touch with you or find out more? Yeah. So I've tried to put everything in one place and it's all at doadaybook.com. So it's a book called Do A Day. So Do A Day Book. You can find my uh, social media links. I'm super active on Twitter. Um, you can find links to Inc. Magazine that we talked about. 
uh, you can actually go to doadaybook.com slash ink and that'll take you through to my, my section of ink. But yeah, all the ink magazine stuff, social media, you can buy the book there. And I put the book out literally everywhere. So wherever you want to buy a book, whether it's paperback or ebook or audiobook, it's literally there, I promise you. Um, but you can find links to all that at doadaybook.com. There's a little store link and you can get all that stuff. Um, and I also have info on coaching. I do speaking engagements as well. So, you know, that's all there at the site. But if people go to doadaybook.com, you find it all. Fabulous. And listeners, again, all of Brian's links, including social media and links to his book on Amazon will be on the show notes page, which you can find at thekimsutton.com forward slash PP168. Brian, this again has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you have a last piece of parting advice or one last golden nugget that you can offer to listeners? Yeah. And I would just say, I've absolutely loved this conversation. It's, it's been really great to share with you, especially, I think you understand this in such a deep way. So I, I loved sharing the story with you and your audience. It really came out. If I could leave people with anything, it's that first building block that I mentioned, because I just don't think any of any of the rest of it really gets to matter if you don't have self-love that, you know, just that simple idea of allowing for yourself to be good and worthy and deserving and capable. You start with that. The rest of it is possible. 